This is an audio review of Chapter 11, Theories of Social Behavior, Exchange and Rational Choice Theories. Okay, so the chapter covers a bunch of different theories that um, lend their ideas to exchange and rational choice theories, so we're going to go through each one a little bit individually. So first up is George Homans. Um, his intellectual influences and core ideas are first coming from B.F. Skinner and behavioral psychology. So we talked a little bit about this before, but um, you know he's really looking at what interested Homans was operant conditioning, which involves a process in which a behavior is reinforced through the use of rewards or punishments. So this conditions the likelihood that the behavior will be repeated or avoided. Through rewards and punishments, all non-instinctual behaviors are learned. So B.F. Skinner, for example, trained his laboratory pigeons to play table tennis by reinforcing or rewarding certain behaviors with food. He was interested in discovering factors that can cause changes in the frequency with which learned behaviors are exhibited. He considered two conditions, the state of the pigeon, or whether or not it's hungry, and the rate at which the behavior in question was reinforced. Punishments also take on two forms. Subjected to aversive conditions, such as an electric shock or a withdrawal of a positive reinforcement, such as the removal of food, if a specified behavior is performed. So costs in this notion are just unavoidable punishments that are produced by a given behavior. They often have the effect of reducing the frequency of an otherwise rewarding behavior. Just makes sense, right? You're rewarded for something, you are punished for something, that's going to mold your behaviors. So that's kind of the basis there of operant conditioning. And he's really pulling this from, you know, um, B.F. Skinner, largely. So um, moving to the explanation of elementary social behavior, this is defined as face-to-face -face contact between individuals in which the reward or punishment each gets from the behavior of others is relatively swift and direct. So Hamans had to take two assumptions into account. The propositions of individual behavior could be adapted to social situations and that the behavior of pigeons could be generalized to the behavior of humans. So individual behavior, whether you're talking about pigeons or humans, involves an exchange between an animal and its physical environment. Hence, hint, exchange theory. So social behavior is based on the type of exchange, and this is his quote, where the activity of each at least two animals reinforces or punishes the activity of the other, and where accordingly each influences the other. Homans argued that the laws of individual behavior developed by B.F. Skinner are identical to the laws of social behavior once the complications of mutual reinforcement are considered. So he created the notion of exchange theory, that as exchanges between individuals are repeated and expanded, we create the social system, which influence each other to create the larger society today. So moving on to some of his behaviorist propositions. So he's got a few of these. He's got the stimulus proposition, the success proposition, the value proposition, and the deprivation satiation proposition. Say that five times fast. So let's go through each one. The stimulus proposition is if previously a particular stimulus has been rewarded, then the more similar the current stimulus is to the past one, the more likely the person is to repeat the action, hence stimulus proposition. The success proposition is the more often an action is followed by a reward, the more likely a person will be to repeat this behavior. The value proposition is the more valuable a particular reward is to a person, the more often they will perform a behavior. And the deprivation satiation proposition is the more often in the recent past an individual has received a particular reward, the less valuable that reward becomes and the following value proposition, the less likely the person is to perform the behavior for which they were rewarded. So if you want little Timmy to behave, and you reward his good behavior with ice cream every time he doesn't like have a meltdown at the grocery store, Timmy gets accustomed to the reward, and he comes to expect it, and it loses its value, and stops being a way to keep little Timmy from behaving poorly. Homan's last behaviorist proposition is the frustration-aggression proposition. 
If a person's action receives a punishment they did not expect, or if the person does not receive the reward they did expect, they will become angry and more likely to exhibit aggressive behavior. So this leads to the problem of distributive justice. To strike a fair balance between the rewards and costs, each party must ex in the exchange must perceive that they are not paying too high a cost relative to the rewards they're gaining. The more often a past in the past an activity has been rewarded, the more anger an individual will display when the same activity done under similar situations is not given a reward. Distributive justice does not just involve ensuring that everyone profits equally, rather it ensures that profits are distributed proportionally. When a balance of expected profits is achieved, distributive justice exists. When either party judges profits to be unjust, then anger or feelings of guilt will follow. So Homans was also interested in how individual action is motivated by the pursuit of profit, or classical economics, which depicts, again, individual action as motivated by profit. So in attempting to realize our goals, we enter a marketplace with others, where each of us seeks to maximize our gains and minimize our costs, although our profits are not measured by a standard quantity such as money. So the law of supply, uh, similar to Homans' value proposition, right, if you know the economic law of supply, says that the higher the price of a good, the more of it a supplier will seek to sell. So Homans' value proposition is similar because it states the more valuable a reward is to a person, the more likely they will, to, will perform a behavior that's rewarded, and the less often they'll perform an alternative activity. So also the law of demand is similar to his behaviorist principle. So the law of demand states that the higher the price of a good, the less of it a consumer will purchase. So similar to the behaviorist principle that the higher the cost incurred by an activity, the less often an individual will then perform it, and the more often they'll engage in an alternative activity. So you can see the kind of clear uh, parallel there. Okay, moving on to Homan's um, theoretical orientation. He looks at how social behavior is explained by psychological principles, that all social behavior, whether it occurs in large-scale organizations and collectivities, is best explained on the basis of individual psychological principles. He um, dismissed structural functionalist theory and contested the central ideas of Emile Durkheim. So let's see, pop quiz. What did Durkheim say about social order? Do, 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 do. Just kidding, I'll give you the answer. That social order arises out of shared beliefs, values, norms, and practices of a given group of people. So social order is the unintended consequence of individuals engaged in a process of give and take. That's what, again, um, he's contesting what Durkheim was saying. So he's saying instead that it's about give and take, depending on the rate of profit, that can lead to either re repeated exchanges or what he calls, you know, what should result from repeated exchanges is social stability, or the pursuit of alternative behaviors or what would be social change. So Homan's approach to action looks at individuals and how they act with the same fundamental goals in mind, maximizing rewards and minimizing costs. And there's some limitations on his rationalist position. The first involves the role of values in decision-making processes. His interest lies in explaining why people behave as they do, in realizing their values, and not why they value the things that they do. The book example was a person new to a job is going to value the help of coworkers, you know, because you don't know what you're doing yet. But other people might have other motivations. So let's say a person's pride is more important to them than their, you know, than knowing what they're doing at their job, then they may not ask for help because the cost of losing their pride and admitting they don't know what they're doing is higher than the reward of being helped by their coworker. So the values that are their own reward, this also greatly complicates the ability to predict and explain an individual's behavior. The second limitation involves the bounded nature of rationality attributed to actors. The ability to fully maximize the profit of one's values is limited by many conditions, including the uniqueness of one's past experiences, the dependence on others for rewards, and the particularities of a given exchange situation. Bounded rationality describes the way that humans make decisions that depart from perfect economic rationality because our rationality is limited by our thinking capacity, the information that is available to us, and time. Instead of making the best choice, we often make choices that are acceptable. 
Okay, that's enough homans. Let's move on to Peter Blau, Intellectual Influences and Core Ideas. So there's some clear similarities and differences with homans. Both homans and Blau are interested in the processes that guide face-to-face -face interaction. Both argued that those interactions are shaped by a reciprocal exchange of rewards. While Hamans was interested in studying exchange relations to uncover behaviorist principles, aka B.F. Skinner pigeon stuff, Blau sought to understand the complex institutions and organizations that develop out of simpler exchange relations between individuals. So Blau abandoned Hamans' brand of behavioral psychology and also emphasized the roles of power, inequality, and the norms of legitimation in interactions. So we skipped the chapter on simul, so we need a little background here so that you can fully understand blah 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 how these theories are building upon his work blah 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 okay so simul um he's interested in analyzing forms of interaction simul argued that sociology should concern itself with analyzing the form in which interaction occurs because it's only through interacting with others that we're able to satisfy our ambitions so understanding the specific content of interactions is of secondary importance. Um, also, you know, more a little bit more about Simmel. So um, while individual motivations or interests may be expressed through an identical form of interaction, the same contents can be expressed through a range of forms of association. Attempts to gain an economic advantage, for instance, can be realized through cooperative agreements among people. Like, let's say, okay, you want to uh, buy a house. You can do that by, like, getting together with, like, five or six of your friends and <laughs> doing that. Um, or, you know, again, let's say you want to rent a place and you can't afford it. You can um, do that through... Um, accumulation of wealth you could do it through like robbing people <laughs> you could you know just again uh, get a couple friends that you can stand living with and you pool your resources together or you could do this through relations of domination or subordination right so there's many ways that you can get to that point so like Simmel, Blau thought that the central task of sociology is to uncover the basic forms of interaction through which individuals pursue their interests or satisfy, satisfy their desires Blau also endorsed Simmel's assertion that in exchange relations lie the, quote, purest and most concentrated form of all human interactions, end quote. Both maintain that every interaction can be understood as a form of exchange in which the participant gives the other more than, he, quote, more than he had himself possessed, end quote. Sorry for using their quotes. They're just, there's so many of them. So the most important aspect of Blau's theoretical perspective is an attempt to analyze the dynamics of exchange or the interplay of rewards and sacrifice that are the building blocks of all social relations. So let's move to the analysis of society's structural properties. So Blau was interested in building a theoretical bridge that would link sociological studies of everyday interactions between individuals and studies that examine the collectivist or structural dimensions of society such as economic systems, political institutions, or belief systems. So Blau's another one of those let's connect the macro and micro kind of thinkers that we've talked about. So the interactionist element in his approach was influenced by the work of Homans, Simmel, and Irving Goffman, while his analysis of society's structural properties was influenced by Max Weber and Talcott Parsons. So he developed his analysis and the role of power and norms of legitimation in shaping group processes. So we'll get a little bit more into the details of that here. Okay, so according to Blau, an individual is able to exercise power over others when they're the sole source for supplying rewards to them. That's kind of the stress on significance of the rewards. So power to Blau is a type of inequality in which an individual or group is able to supply rewards to other individuals or groups who are unable to offer benefits in return. So he says that there's a submission imposed by an imbalanced exchange. So what is an imbalanced exchange? This is just an exchange based on an inequality in resources that in turn leads to relationships marked by power and submission. In defining power in terms of inequality of resources and the submission that an imbalanced exchange imposes, Blau considers the processes that shape the exercise of power and the rise of opposition to it. These processes explain both stability and change in interpersonal and in group relations and in more complex social institutions. The role of social norms of fairness, 
also affect the legitimacy that they confer or deny those in dominant positions. This is also of central importance. So here's an example. If you're like, what the hell is she talking about? The Roe v. Wade repeal decision in the Supreme Court, right? You have a Supreme Court that, as you know, uh, one of my favorite podcasters, Brad from Bradcast, likes to say, is a packed and stolen Supreme Court. As during the Obama administration, Mitch McConnell refused to hold hearings to approve Obama's pick for the high court, the, the attorney general, later attorney general Merrick Garland. The logic that Mitch McConnell used was that it was too close to an election to let the president nominate a new Supreme Court justice because it was eight months before the 2016 election. He lied and said there was a historical precedent to not allowing that to happen during an election year, which again was not true. Then in 2020, he conveniently forgot the same logic, quote, you know, logic in quotes, and actually created another historical lie saying you'd have to go back to the 1800s to find an opening on the court happening during an election, also provably false. And he used that to justify pushing through the confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court. Of course, you know, the, the least qualified person ever on the Supreme Court, um, eight days before the 2020 election. So that was an election where most of us were still distancing at home and voting by mail. So many people had already voted at that point. And under McConnell's own original statement, we should have waited to see who they elected, who, again, Biden, with over 7 million more votes than Trump, before pushing through a new judge. Amy Coney Barrett was known for being against Roe v. Wade and made the crucial fifth conservative vote on the court, basically guaranteeing the overturn of Roe v. Wade, established law for 50 years due to political motivations, not legal ones. So how valid do people see the stolen Supreme Court? Well, going back to the social norms of fairness and what Blau is talking about, there are two people on the court that were put there by political gains and not the will of the people. That undermines the legitimacy of their decisions and how much trust people will put in the court for years to come. And then, of course, there's the whole, like, uh, Clarence Thomas, all his trips and his motorhome and his mother's house being bought by a billionaire that had interest before the court. Um, and then, of course, there's Kavanaugh, <laughs> who, um, yeah, uh, really likes to get blackout drunk. Okay, so let's move on. Legitimate authorities. Ooh, another fun one. So legitimate authority is defined by Blau as a superior's right to demand compliance from subordinates and their willing obedience that's based on shared norms that constrain an individual's response to issued directives. So what's an example of legitimate authority? Well, cops, right? They can pull you over. Uh, you have to comply with them because they have legitimate authority, <laughs> which is also like a people tend to forget in California, right? We have a lot of car chases as a result of people being like, nope, not complying. But again, um, you know, legitimate authority means you have to comply versus when I'm on the freeway and one of my biggest pet peeves is the people who pretend like they don't understand what merging is, um, which again, you do it every time you get on the freeway. So you mean every time you get on the freeway, you're a jerk and you just go in front of a bunch of people or you keep driving on the lane on the side like you don't notice everyone else's merge because you're like super special and important, much better than everyone else. Again, sorry, I'm ranting because I just hate those people. So um, they pretend like they don't know what merging is. I'd love to pull them over. I'd love to ticket them or arrest them because I do not have legitimate authority and God knows if I did, I would punish all of them. Uh, no one's gonna stop for me, right? So legitimate authority kind of has that, um, there's a willing obedience involved, right? So this really connects to um, imbalanced exchange relations. These are governed by shared expectations of the cultural values that legitimate them. As long as the superior meets or exceeds the expectation for rewards deemed acceptable by the group, then the legitimacy given to them will foster the stability of the group. So there's also costs incurred by subordinates. Blau contends that these costs are both in the services they perform and in the very act of submission, that that must be judged fair relative to the benefits derived for obedience. Otherwise, opposition to the superior's exercise of power may arise, and with it, the potential for change in the structure of existing interpersonal or institutional relationships. This judgment rests ultimately on consensual normative standards of fairness. So for instance, um, Black Lives Matter has, you know, really um, promoted 
exposure and accountability for the problem of police killings of unarmed people of color, um, and especially those who are uh, experiencing mental health crises. So we can only see policing as legitimate when it's fair. And it's not fair in our society. It has not been. It's not a new phenomenon, right? These, these problems are, are generational. So the more people realize the inequities that are related to policing, the less fair they're gonna think the police are. And that's going to impact the kind of power and legitimate authority they would have in society, right? Okay, another example. You're like, what are you talking, why are you talking about police? Okay, another example. <laughs> After 9-11, there was a lot of changes in how people were surveilled by the government. People thought that it was okay to lose some of their civil liberties as long as it was done to protect them, specifically to prevent future terrorist attacks. And so people ignored uh, the government spying on mosques or you know predominantly Muslim communities, um, things that violated the constitution. But we largely had exchanged some freedom for security during that time period. Fun fact, it didn't stop when the time period stopped. It just kind of gave a green light to this kind of warrantless wiretapping, to surveilling everyone, to the point of literally having everyone's information all of the time. All right, continuing on. So Peter Blau, um, looking at his theoretical orientation, he attempts to understand complex structures, and any attempt to understand complex structures must begin with an analysis of the patterns and daily exchanges that guide individual conduct. So um, when Simmel's objective was to explain the dynamics of exchange relations that emerge between individuals and groups as they jointly pursue their interests, there's a difference in the dynamics of exchange relations between individuals and groups through blouse. At the root, exchange relations present individuals with four basic interaction options, which provide the context for an individual's calculation of rewards and costs for exchange. Once an option is pursued, it establishes the relational structure for subsequent exchanges or exchange calculations. You know, you live, you learn, basically. Okay, and then the theoretical shift to incorporate collectivist aspects. So in attempting to build a theory of social structure on the basis of those simpler processes of shape, you know, the things that shaped face-to-face -face interactions, um, Blau, unlike Homans, saw in shared norms a generalized mechanism that defines the expectations and governs the reactions of those subjected to power imbalances. Okay, direct quote alert. Blau viewed, quote, okay, value consciousness as a crucial link allowing for, quote, integrative bonds and social solidarity among millions of people in society, most of whom have never met, and which alone make it possible to transcend personal transactions and develop complex networks of independent exchange, end quote. At least I warned you the quote was coming. Like Homans, Blau assumed a restricted view on the nature of rational action, arguing that individuals, direct quote alert, choose between alternative potential associates or courses of action by evaluating the experiences or expected experiences with each in terms of preference ranking and then selecting the best alternative. This will make sense after reviewing extrinsic and intrinsic rewards. So entrans, extrinsic rewards are things that are detachable from the association which they're acquired. They're tangible rewards, things like money, a promotion. It could be winning a tournament in sports and the extrinsic reward is getting a trophy. Intrinsic rewards are things that we find pleasurable, not because they provide the means for obtaining other benefits. They're basically psychological benefits, not financial ones. So examples of intrinsic rewards are celebrating a holiday with family, going on a walk with a friend, or love, the purest type of intrinsic reward. Aww. Um, fun fact, there's a cat laying in my lab right now, so if you hear the purring, I apologize. I can't, I can't edit that out. Okay, um, intimate relations. This is an interesting <laughs> divergence of where he gets into this kind of stuff. It gets really interesting here, talking about costs and benefits. It's often the case that in intimate relationships one individual is more in love than the other, at least in his view. So the interest in maintaining the relationship is not equal. This can create an imbalance that advantages one partner while disadvantaging the other, as the cost for ending the relationship as well as the willingness to endure the cost to maintain it are not equal. As in the case of other types of relationships, the individual who's less committed in an intimate relationship is able to exercise power over the other, 
whose greater interest in maintaining the relationship resigns them to a dependent position. Like other benefits offered, affections that are given too freely then decrease in value. So when you apply this perspective to dating, he considered dating like a challenge of conquest in which those who are successful in making many conquests value attractiveness in their own eyes as well as those of others. Conversely, resisting conquests implies that one has many alternatives to choose from, which then enhances a person's desirability in the eyes of others, right? So if you date too many people, apparently your value goes down. Ugh, so problematic, right? Uh, conversely, being like, no, I'm too choosy. No, no, thank you. means you have all the options. Um, problematic, <laughs> right? We'll just say that. But it is interesting how much people do believe in this idea that uh, power in a relationship does reside in the person that cares least. Okay, let's move on now to James Coleman. Yay! Okay, so um, rational choice theory is very similar to, to exchange theory. So that was all the exchange folks. Now we're moving on. So rational choice... Um, Again, what do they share? They share a view that the actor is rational, that they're purposive, and that they're motivated by maximizing rewards or realizing their interests. So exchange theorists were really interested in the decision-making of individuals and how individual decisions can produce, sustain, modify, or terminate social relationships within small groups. Within sociological theory, rational choice theorists, while still interested in strategic decisions of individuals, are more likely to look at the decisions within the context of group dynamics. So rational choice theorists explore how interaction between rationally motivated individuals can produce norms, networks, controls of resources, and group solidarity, and how these factors orient or constrain individuals decisions and their behaviors. So let's get into what does that even mean? Okay, so trust and norms. Cooperation with others is based on individual rational calculations that the chances of reaping rewards are greater than the chances of incurring costs. So there's a possible reward from trusting. Basically, a reward can be gained by placing your trust in another person but this is not going to be equal and or equally available to everybody. But instead, it distributed across broader social dimensions of age, gender, class, race, etc., 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 because each of these influences the amount and type of resources a person has and who they end up associating with. So it's of advantage to the trustee to be trustworthy in order to reap the potential future benefits that come with establishing a reputation as a trustworthy person. Like, let's say you want to have a positive exchange with someone, um, you say that you're going to do something and you come through on that, right? You become trustworthy, there's a likelihood in the future they're going to think that person's trustworthy, I'm coming back to them. I think of this always in relation to like mechanics. I've had great ones, I've had terrible ones. And you just end up going back to that same one that's really reliable or trustworthy because not always is that the case. Um, and then likewise, it's, adva- it's advantageous to the trustor, right, to place trust in someone else when there's a possible gain for doing so that outweighs the possible risk that the person might be untrustworthy. And that risk is going to increase or decrease depending on the information you have about that person and the amount of possible gain or loss. This is why you get like a phone call from a random person that's like, I want to give you a million dollars. No, that's not real. You can't trust that, right? Um, But again, it's the idea of the risk of, of doing that and how close you are, how trustworthy this source is, is going to impact how you would then react. So there's a rational calculation in trusting. The decision to place trust in another involves the same rational calculations that are involved in deciding whether or not to place a bet both entail knowing how much will be lost and how much can be gained or won and the chances of winning. So Coleman sees the norms emerging on the basis of actors' rational considerations. They develop out of repeated exchanges between a limited number of individuals who have an interest in maintaining a relationship with one another. The norms that emerge apply only to those individuals involved in the relationship. 
This view contrasts with collectivist theories like structural functionalism, where norms are taken as pre-existing givens, more or less internalized universally by individuals within any social system. While Coleman's saying that the norms that emerge through interactions are really only applying to the people that were in those particular interactions or in those groups. Okay, so kind of building on that, the emergence and adherence of norms. So this is, again, kind of going back to what we we're talking about with Homans. Um, you know, he in also incorporated norms such as his concept of distributive justice into his version of exchange theory. So again, norms in the more sociological conventional view are just taken for granted behavioral expectations that people internalize so that they can, you know, kind of interact or have shared values in a society. But according to Coleman, norms are really socially defined informal rights that control the actions of others. So when you establish a norm in Coleman's view, people are then required to forfeit the right to control some aspect of their own actions. So in that exact, you know, that kind of exchange logic. So even when internalized by the individual, the existence of norms is always an open question. So meaning they have to be reproduced anew as people um, interact and through those interactions weigh the costs and benefits of conforming to those norms or challenging those norms. So individuals who hold the right to control the actions of others are beneficiaries of the norms because they realize the benefits from encouraging others to perform or refrain from particular actions. The targets of the norms, in Coleman's view, are those who give up the rights to control their actions. So the beneficiaries also must be able to apply sanctions. Again, remember sanctions we talked about last time, the rewards and punishments that, you know, um, help ensure compliance, right? So, so beneficiaries have to be able to apply sanctions to targets to get them to comply with their demands, especially in situations where targets have not internalized the desire to conform. So targets are rewarded by the beneficiaries with positive sanctions for compliance, and then targets are punished by the beneficiaries with negative sanctions when they engage in a behavior that's not considered appropriate. So some people will internalize the demands that are coming from those people, and they will self-sanction their conduct by basically internally, you know, kind of creating a system where they, they challenge themselves to perform the proper behavior or what he calls internally generated rewards for performing the proper behavior. So basically they're internalizing the demand that's coming from these beneficiaries and they'll self sanction their conduct typically so that they can, again, you know, receive those rewards and not, or, you know, maybe avoid the punishments. So this comes down to in rational choice, again, benefits and costs, right? So those who would benefit from encouraging or preventing particular behaviors may find the rewards gained are outweighed by the cost of sanctions. So when looking at imposing sanctions, the distribution of power and resources determines who can or can't impose sanctions and who is or is not subjected to sanctions. So individuals with greater power and resources are less likely to abide by norms and also less likely to be sanctioned. It's less costly to sanction people of lower status. And this is a calculation that perhaps accounts for the fact that often the same violation will have harsher punishments like fines or prison terms for lower status people than for higher status people that get like a slap on the wrist. So according to Coleman, it's in one's self-interest to reproduce their own submission. So then open networks consist of a group of individuals who are connected to only a few members of the larger group, while closed networks consist of a group of individuals who have connections with and knowledge of many of the group's members. Okay, so finally moving past trust and norms. <laughs> so free rider refers to an individual's rational decision not to participate in group activity if the goals of the group or the joint goods it produces cannot be denied to the individual and if their supply is not reduced by other people consuming them. Coleman was also interested in group solidarity, how common interests derived from a shared structural position are not enough to produce group solidarity. Most people do not engage in collective action, like for instance, activism, that 
you know, will further their personal interests, right? They advocate for themselves. Uh, so an example of that could be, you know, the working class failing to collectivize and demand a more equitable distribution of wealth in the richest country in the history of the world. So is it rational, though, that many do not engage in collective action because they look to other people to do it? as they will still be rewarded if those other people are successful in their actions. So the book example looks at those who engage in collective action to try and address climate catastrophe, right? So some people are totally willing to let other people fight for clean drinking water or clean air or to stop pollution because they themselves will also benefit from those fights but they're not willing to incur the costs such as going to jail or maybe just donating money to environmental protection groups as everyone will be rewarded if others fight that fight. Or this also happens with things like, for instance, uh, union membership in this country. Some workers choose not to join a union at their work when one is available, and even though they don't contribute money to the whole, they still benefit by having the raises and fair working conditions and other benefits that are provided by the union for all workers in a workplace. And this is coming from that landmark Janus decision in the Supreme Court in 2018 that said that non-members, and especially in public uh, you know, public sector unions, <clears throat> that non-members do not have to pay dues to a union they don't support. So specifically for public sector unions like the ones I am in, and what's interesting is the assumption was that most people, if given the out, were going to stop paying their dues. And, you know, when a couple of years later, they didn't have that drop that they thought that they would, then there's has there's not been a noticeable decline in workers who choose to not pay their union dues, um, suggesting that people do see the positive power of collective action in their workplaces. So anyway, going back to Coleman's argument, participation yet exclusion from consumption. So why do some people participate in the production of joint goods? when they can't be excluded from the benefits if they participate. So why are people paying union dues when they'll get the pay raise and other benefits that the union wins for workers even if they don't participate? So rational choice theorists offer three reasons why this might be. The first one is that groups can reward individuals for their participation through selective incentives. These are benefits that are distributed exclusively to those who bear the cost of providing a good. So selective incentives can take on any number of forms. This could be winning a leadership position in a revolutionary movement, or it could be something like getting a coffee mug or a bumper sticker because you donated to you know, PBS or something. <laughs> um, second, individuals may work towards achieving a group goal for the intangible benefits, right? We talked about extrinsic, intrinsic, the intangible benefits that participation can provide. So it could be their pride in union membership or their belief in a common good for themselves and for their coworkers. Or going back to that environmental example, they may do collective actions because they believe it's right and they value that belief. So third, free riding can be minimized by enforcing participation or negatively sanctioning individuals for not contributing to the public good. Okay, moving on to Coleman's theoretical orientation. A rationalist view is demonstrated when actors have a single principle of action that of acting so as to maximize the relation of interest as they weigh the potential rewards and punishments accompanying their behavior. Sorry, that was a direct quote. That's why it's complicated. <laughs> so Coleman's rationalist approach to action is, is readily apparent in his conceptualization of trust, right? We talked about trust and that, you know, it's a rational process where you gain things, you lose things, like you gain something from trusting someone else, but you also gain something from being trusted in the relationship that forms from there. So Coleman's orientation to the question of order, while predominantly individualist, he recognized the collectivist aspects of the patterning of social life. So his view states that the, it's best understood, or to best understand social life, then you have to be attuned to the feedback processes through which individual purpose action is translated into a collectivist or system level property that then works back down to influence the action of individuals. So we talked about this before in class. It's this cycle from individual action to collective action that then informs, goes back to informing individual action again. 
So norms are collectivist constructs that can lead individuals to pursue particular courses of action because the sanctions that are attached to them condition the weighing of benefits and costs, and thus the likelihood of undertaking a given path of behavior. However, norms are not absolute determinants of action, right? They're basically just something that you've determined that there is a cost-benefit analysis going on there, right? So in his quote-unquote words, they are elements which affect individuals' decisions about what actions it will be in their interest to carry out, right? So really, norms, like he said, it's, it's kind of his own departure from the more traditional sociological view of norms that are just something that we all kind of come to internalize. And he's saying it's through those particular exchanges or interactions that people come to kind of emerge their own sense of norms. And that depending on how the you know costs and the benefits are related to either performing that norm appropriately or not um, that that's going to affect someone's motivated action and it can change over time right so for coleman theories that emphasize the collectivist determinants of social life present quote a fatalistic view of the future in which humans are the pawns of forces outside of their control at the mercy of these uncontrolled external or internal forces, persons are unable to shape their destiny. So Coleman's intent is to counter that viewpoint by basically saying that everything that is social must be created and maintained, right, through those interactions that people are having, having and that those maintained or created accomplishments are going to be affected only through the purpose of action of individuals.